It's been a while since I've done this. But I have a word that I believe that God has spoken into my heart. It took me a while to decide what I wanted to share this morning. But um, it was quite clear because even though I kept, you know, uh, this was one of the first things that came to my mind when I was thinking about what to share. But I kept thinking, no, there must be something better. <laughs> so I kept pushing that thought aside, but this kept coming back to me. So um, I decided that this is what God wants me to share this morning. Something that I feel that is a need for the church, a need in the world today. It is something that we have also looked at a lot in Sunday school because this is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And uh, the thing that I want to talk about this morning is faithfulness. I would like to talk this morning about what God wants from us and what God expects from us in terms of faithfulness. I was looking at um, the dictionary to see what the definition of faithfulness is. So before we do that, can anyone maybe here just shout out what you think? What is faithfulness? What does faithfulness mean? Does it mean full of faith? Faithfulness? Anyone has a... No? It struck me that this word faithfulness has nothing to do with our faith but rather to do with someone else's faith in us. Yes, when we say God is faithful, it doesn't mean that he is full of faith. It means that we have faith that no matter what, he is constant, he is loyal, amen? And this is what the dictionary says is faithfulness. Continuing to support someone or be their friend even in difficult situations. When you think about the world today, it's very popular and common to see fair weather friends. When things are going great, they want to be your friend. When things are not so great, they disappear. We see this in the Bible, in the story of the prodigal son. I've seen it in the lives of my own family members where, uh, you know, I had a cousin who inherited a lot of money at one point when, when, one of, when his parents both passed away. And he had these friends, they would just be constantly around him. One year, two years, money was gone. They all just disappeared. So faithfulness is lacking in this world to a great extent. Another definition that was written was steadfast. Steadfast in allegiance and affection. Steadfast in allegiance and affection. Loyal and constant. So what I want you to remember is that faithfulness has nothing to do with your level of faith, but it rather has to do with what God sees in us. The word faithfulness doesn't actually come too many times in the Bible when you compare it with words like faith or love. It only comes a little over a hundred times. But did you know that most of the times that the word faithfulness is used, it is not used to, to describe a person. It is only used to describe God. Because that level of faithfulness is something that only God can have. Because as humans, we tend to go with our emotions. And, and there are only two times in the Bible that the word faithfulness is used by God, as in God speaking, referring to someone. One was in Numbers chapter 12 where uh, God says, Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful. He is faithful in all my house. That is one reference where God says in Numbers 12. And the other one refers to Antipas in Revelation, where, God refers, where Jesus refers to him as my faithful martyr. Apart from this, the word faithful is mostly described, I mean, it's mostly used to describe God. But we know that there are, that's not true that in the sense that those are not the only two people in the whole Bible that were faithful. There were a lot of faithful people in the Bible. And um, we'll look at a few of them today as we continue. But before we go on, I just want to clarify a few things about what faith is. Number one, as I said, faithfulness has nothing to do with our faith, but rather to do with how much God trusts us. The second thing that I want to see is that faithfulness is a fruit. Right? And like any other fruit, it needs to grow. 
It's not something that appears overnight. But, you know, when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, there are, you know, we love, joy, peace. But certain things come more naturally to some people. Like, some people are naturally very patient. And some people are naturally very, have a lot of self-control. So whatever it is. But faithfulness is also something that some people have. But that doesn't mean we need to stop at the level that we are. We always need to push for more. And how do you think faithfulness grows? How did, how did God become sure of Noah's faithfulness? Where he chose Noah as the one man to save? Or how did God be sure of Job's faithfulness? The faithfulness that they had was seen in their life every single day. That's the only way God, there's no, there was no special thing that happened. They showed their faithfulness, faithfulness through their living. And faithfulness is also often tested through trials. In 1 Peter 4.12 it says, Beloved, do not be amazed and bewildered at the fiery ordeal which is taking place to test your quality. As though something strange, unusual and alien to you and your position were befalling you. That is a test of your faithfulness. Something what is the word here? Fiery ordeal. Are you going to be faithful through your fiery ordeal? Further down in 1 Peter 4.19 it says, Those who are ill-treated and suffer in accordance with God's will must do right and commit their souls to the one who will never fail them. So here it's talking about our faithfulness with regard to God's faithfulness. Yes? It's easy to remain faithful when everything is going great. In Romans 5, Paul talks about how trials and tribulations prove our character. So when you were faced with something in your life that was a challenge, did you remain faithful? I will never forget a conversation I had with a friend once who said, you know, I'm praying for this particular thing. I've been praying for this for a very long time. And if God does not answer, that's it. I'm done. This particular friend had the answer. To, his, to the prayer that he was praying. But I often think about what would have happened if he did not receive the answer he wanted. Would he have really turned his back on God? So faithfulness is a fruit. Let us, as it says, count it joy when we fall into trials, as it says in James 1-2, because it only serves to prove to God that we are faithful in all things. The third thing I want to talk about is that faithfulness is God's very nature. As I mentioned, most of the times the word is used, we talk about faithfulness with reference to God. And as Christians, though our ultimate goal is an eternity in heaven, praising God, our goal while we are still here is also to transform ourselves to become more and more like Christ. To become more and more like Him. I'm sure you'll all agree we fail more often than we succeed. We decide we are going to be this, we're going to do that, I'm going to read the Bible without fail. And then things happen, life happens and very often we end up disappointing ourselves. When I was, when I started going to church, I'm, I think I was in the 7th or 8th grade. I was taken to church by a very close friend and her family. And uh, for me, church at that time was just companionship. I had a friend who took me to Sunday school where I made other friends. You know, this is why I think Sunday school is so important. Because not all the children come there with a, with, a, with a yearning to learn about God. Some of them are just there for the fun. Some of, the, some of them are there for the music or the song. Some of them are there for the snacks. Some of them are there for the games. Some of them are there for their friends. There's nothing wrong with that. Let the children come. Because we don't know which of those children is going to grow up and serve the Lord. So for me, I was one of those who was there for friends. I do remember later on very clearly the, when I responded to an altar call, the day I took my water baptism, all that is there. But in the initial days, it was very clearly seen in my life that I was there for friends. Right? And I used to see all these friends around me who had... Christian upbringings like proper family prayer and 
Bible studies at home and and I was used to think, you know, I'm not even reading the Bible every day. I don't do this. And, you know, I used to feel guilt. This verse, this one verse that touched my heart one day while I was reading. Till today, every now and then when I feel, you know, like I'm not doing enough or I'm failing in some way, you know, as a, as a parent or, or uh, as a friend, or when I feel like I'm failing, or especially as a child of God, like when I do something I know I shouldn't have done, this is the verse that keeps coming back to my mind. 2 Timothy 2.13, where it says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. There are very few things that God cannot do. We know God can do anything. God can move mountains. God can part the sea. Nothing is impossible through Christ. But there are a few things that God cannot do and will not do. He cannot deny his nature. And it is his nature that no matter how we are, like we saw in the definition of faithfulness, through tough times, no matter what, steadfast, he remains faithful. Amplified version says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, true to his word and his righteous character, because he cannot deny himself. Now, does this mean that we are to be faithless? <laughs> no, absolutely not. We need to continue as children of God to pursue excellence in Christ. But also we need to remember that God loves us and is faithful to us despite all our shortcomings. So where should our faithfulness lie? So this is what I want to share this morning. Where our faithfulness should lie? First and foremost, our faithfulness should lie with God and His Word. Amen? First and foremost, our faithfulness should lie to God and His Word. We are stewards of Christ and it says, Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4.2 It is required of stewards that they be found faithful. We know the parable of the faithful servant. So now we spoke about the definition of faithful. What do you think is the opposite of faithful? Anyone? Faithless? Unfaithful? Yes? But if you look at the parable in Matthew 24, the opposites drawn there are faithful and? If you look at your Bible, you'll see the, you'll see the answer there. Faithful and? What is the opposite there? Matthew 24, it also comes in Mark 23. Evil. This is something that hit me very hard. Because I was like, there's in, in, in uh, NIV version it says wicked. So the opposite of faithful is not unfaithful or faithless. It is evil or wicked. It's like children who are unsupervised. No one is watching. What are you doing? Zoe will tell you how she can never hide anything from me. Because I know her. I know her so well. She's the one who always, you know, when she's doing something and I can see it on her face that she has done something that she was not supposed to do. So, a few weeks ago there was this comic in the newsletter said, said something along the lines of you can never hide anything from your mother. She was highly offended. <laughs> so um, it's the same. We can do whatever we want to do. But God is always watching. He knows. So are we being faithful? Are, are we being wicked? It comes down to every choice that we make as human beings. How we live. Are we living a life that shows our faithfulness to God? like Noah or like Job. In every single command that is given in the Bible, are we, we may not be following everything right now, but we need to be aspiring towards them. Even if you are not doing it right now, you need to know your shortcomings and that we need to work towards where we are falling short. Secondly, we need to be faithful, as I said, to, our, to God and to His Word. I was watching this documentary about... Uh, bears 
and I didn't know this till recently, but there are a lot of countries where bears are eaten, where they hunt and eat bear meat. And among these bears, there's one particular variety of black bear, which is uh, hunted in Alaska, which is called the blueberry bear. And I found this very amusing. It sounded like the title of a children's book or something, blueberry bear. Do you know why it's called the blueberry bear? Because before it goes into hibernation, for those few weeks, for 20 hours a day, it eats blueberries. 20 hours a day, non-stop, it's feeding itself, preparing, you know, loading up on calories before it goes into hibernation. It eats nothing but berries. And in one day, it eats as much as 9 to 10 kilos of blueberries. And you know, when they hunt this bear and for meat, and they cut the meat, the very meat and fat of the bear is blue. And they say it's one of the most amazing meats to eat and it's so tasty because of the flavor and etc. But I was thinking this applies to us as well. When we are cut, is our response that comes out of us based on the word. 20 hours a day this bear feeds on blueberries. How much are we feeding on the word of God? Psalm 119, I don't need to tell you this verse. Psalm 119 verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is the reason why we need to also spend time teaching our children key verses that will help them when they are faced with decisions in their lives. Can we all repeat, I will remain faithful to God and his word. Can we say that? Amen. Second thing, faithfulness to God's house. First was faithfulness to God and his word. The second thing is faithfulness to God's house. How many of you have heard the term church hopping? Thankfully, none of us here are in that habit. But when I was young and I heard this word, I found it very amusing. Comes, the term comes from the practice that young people have of going pub hopping. When they drink, youngsters who go out and drink, they go from pub to pub drinking. So church hopping was drawn, drawn along those same lines and somehow I didn't like the way that sounded. One of my favorite verses and everyone in Sunday school knows this is Psalm 92, 13 where it says, those who are, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our Lord, right? This is our, actually our verse for Sunday school for this year. This was our, our theme verse for the year. And I've often spoken about this to the kids as well, about how we need to be planted not in a pot in the house of the Lord, but actually in the house of the Lord. Because what is the difference between a tree that is planted in the ground and a tree that's planted in a pot? Not happy with the church? Pick up your pot. Go somewhere else. Right? But a tree that's planted in the house of the Lord is rooted firmly. Amen? Think about the roots of those plants. Can you easily go and hold and uproot a tree that is planted in the ground? No. Because those roots would have gone so deep that they have, they have a firm hold over the soil. But a potted plant, even a child can uproot. Those, that's what happens when our faith is tested, when our faithfulness is tested. When we are planted in the word, when we are planted in his house where God has placed us, it is very difficult to shake that person. They will face it head on knowing that God is faithful and God is with them. But a person who is planted in a pot, who doesn't belong where God wants him to be or wants her to be, that person is easily uprooted and easily shaken. Hebrews 10.25 also tells us not to turn our back on gathering as a church. God is very concerned with our fellowship. Who are we spending our time with? What are our relationships? Psalm 1 talks about who we stand, sit and walk with. The very first psalm. Stands, sits and walks. Basically that's all we do mostly. Apart from the time that we are sleeping. <laughs> We either stand, sit, or walk. Who are we standing, sitting, or walking with? There are endless verses in Proverbs that talk about the importance of 
choosing our friends and keeping good company. One thing I should mention when we're talking about being faithful to God's house. I'm sure many of you here have heard the term cancel culture. Have you heard of cancel culture? These days, you say one thing wrong that offends someone else, you are cancelled. We will not listen to you anymore. We will not be interested in anything you say because you have offended me. Cancel culture is everywhere. People don't like to be offended. Just this morning, Auntie Geraldine, I met her outside. Auntie is back after spending a few weeks in Australia. And she said how the church there was so dead. And when she went to the pastor and said, Pastor, why is church like this? Where is the life? Where is the spirit? He said, this is what the people want. If I do something different, that's it. And I was thinking how much the Bible talks about correction in the Bible, in the, in the early church. Nowadays, pastors cannot even say or do anything. Thankfully, we don't have that issue here. We, we are open to correction. I've seen that multiple times in many of our members. But I've seen it so many times where people get offended. Oh, that pastor, he corrected me. I better go to some other church. Only thing I have to say to that is Proverbs 12.1. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. I don't like that word stupid. I tell my kids not to use it, but that's the word in the Bible, the actual word. He who loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now no chastening seems joyful for the present, but painful. Chastening is another word for scolding or correction. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by, trained by it. The message version says, at the time, correction isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against your grain. Later, of course, it pays off big time, for it is the well-trained who find themselves matured in their relationship with God. Say, I will remain faithful to the house of God. Third, faithfulness to our spouse and our family. Faithfulness to our spouse, it's there in the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus took it a few steps further and said, you don't even have to commit adultery. You think about it itself, you have already sinned. You've already done it. We've already established that faithfulness means the other person's faith in us. So as a spouse, are you living in such a way that the other person is sure that you are faithful? Or are you leaving cause for doubt? What about your family, the rest of your family? Do your children know that you will love them no matter what they do? Children make mistakes, children do things, but do, you, do they know that your faithfulness to them does not rely on what they do, but that it is unchanging and constant? The number of times we make mistakes, the number of times we do things that are hurtful or must be terrible when we think about what God sees when he looks at us. But God remains faithful through it all. Do our children know that they have that same unwavering faithfulness from their parents? No matter what I do, my mom or my dad will never turn their back on me. They need to have that. When I think about families, one of the first people I think of is Ruth. I, I mean, I think about her, I mean, she's such an amazing person. Most of us in that situation would have run back to mommy's house. Yes? The women here, I'm sure you'll agree. Most of us would have just gone back to our parents' house. Of course, Naomi sounds like she was a, she was a wonderful mother-in-law. She must have been a kind person. And she clearly was because she wanted the happiness of her daughters-in-law. She knew that she had nothing to offer them. So she told them, go. But through her faithfulness, what did Ruth become? She became one of the four women mentioned in the genealogy of Christ. One of the four women. She would not have met or married Boaz. There would have been no Obed. There would have been no Jesse. There would have been no David. 
her faithfulness and obedience to follow and serve and she said your god will be my god and she followed her mother in law and through that faithfulness jesus came into this world another person i think of is noah's wife i often think about her what a time she must have had when her husband was doing god did not talk i don't know if god spoke to her but god spoke to noah everyone is laughing at him everyone is making fun of him look at this mad man building a boat how hard it must have been to be noah's wife when everyone is making fun of your husband but i assume she was faithful i assume she stood by him she probably even helped out because it was not a job that could have been done easily he had his family and together they were saved and she was as faithful as him maybe she had her doubts but in the end she was faithful there is great blessing and reward in being faithful to our family and to our spouse say i will remain faithful to my god given spouse and family fourth faithfulness in our finances faithfulness in our finances i regularly talk about tithing because i make the announcements here and i talk about how important it is it is for us to tithe in god's house and give offerings in our early days of marriage like most young couples sometimes money was tight but i used to be very confused about tithing habits as i mentioned i did not grow up in a home that taught me these things neither was it taught clearly in the church that i used to go to before so for me it was very confusing because my husband was not tithing 10% more than double that and i used to think already things are tight do the 10% that's what you know that was in my mind i i don't remember if i told him or asked him about it but it's been a long time but you know it it it, it blew my mind at the time because it was like already things are tight you know i'm sure most of you will understand what i'm trying to say if today we are blessed if today we are debt free i believe that one of the main reasons is that god honored that giving amen tithing is a powerful thing to unlock what god has for us but faithfulness in finance doesn't only talk about tithes and offerings it also talks about our relationship with money god bible talks about it very clearly what is our attitude towards money is everything that we do driven by monetary motives money 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 how doesn't matter whether the relationships are affected so many people like that in today's world relationships don't matter the end of the day what matters is money how do we use our money the money that we have are you using it are we using it judiciously are we using it biblically do we waste it or spend it on things that are not approved by god maybe that's why sometimes blessings don't come maybe we are tithing and doing our offerings but also sometimes the other things that are not falling into place Luke 16:10 says he who is faithful in what is least is also in much whatever we have let us be faithful in how we handle our money say i will be faithful with the money god has given me the fifth thing is faithful to our bosses and to our employees Bible talks about masters and servants in many places. As an employee, sometimes it's hard with certain bosses to honor them, to be loyal and faithful to them. The person that strikes me the most in the Bible with reference to this is Daniel. He was a captive he was not taken he didn't go there willingly right he was captured to think about how faithfully he did his work there that he was lifted up so high in spite of the fact that he was a captive always amazes me he was so good so excellent 
but they couldn't even find a fault with him. So they had to make up a new law to accuse him of breaking it. How amazing is that? Sometimes it's hard to be faithful to people who are not believers, who don't believe the same things we do. But wherever God has placed us, wherever God has called us to be, we are his salt and his light. We need to be excellent to show the same spirit of excellence that Daniel did. Because in the end, what that does is it glorifies our God in heaven. Similarly, as bosses, as masters, there are a lot of things. You might, you might be working in an office with a team under you. You might have a lot of employees working for you. Or you might be at home and you have a maid. The same thing happens. Give them what is due. James 5.4 talks about giving correct wage. Be kind and merciful to them. Colossians 4.1 talks about this. We are called to be good employers and good employees. Say, I will be a faithful boss and a faithful employee. Lastly, faithful to our nation and to our government. Sometimes it's really hard to do that. <laughs> Really hard to be faithful to our nation and to our government when things are not going our way. Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the, resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So how do we show our faithfulness to the government? How do we show our faithfulness to the nation? By following the law, paying our taxes. Every single thing that I'm talking about here is already mentioned in the Bible. Which is why I feel it's so easy to be a good citizen, to be a good Christian, even in a country that is not following the same religion that we are following because the Bible already has all the laws in it. The Bible makes sense. It made sense then. It makes sense today. Any sensible government that has sensible laws will be in alignment with the Bible because the Bible has sensible things in it. So by following the law of the land, we are honoring and being faithful to our nation and to our government. See, I will be faithful to the nation God has placed me in. So faithful to God and his word. Faithful to the house of God. Faithful to our spouse and to our family. Faithful with our finances. Faithful to our bosses and our employees. Faithful to our nation. Of course there's a lot more things we need to be faithful. To. All our relationships, our friends, etc. But these were the six that I wanted to share about. And there is a great reward in faithfulness. Great reward in faithfulness. God exalts the faithful. God provides protection and salvation for the faithful. Look at Noah. Look at Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Daniel, David. There is great blessing in being faithful. Faithful people like Job who got double what he lost. There is honor in being faithful. Abraham was faithful. And now he is the father of many, of all of us who believe. That is the word I have this morning for all of us. That even in this world where we see divorce, divorce rates skyrocketing and people living in a way that they're just trying to, to you know, make the best situation for themselves, not caring about who they step over. Husbands being unfaithful, wives being unfaithful, friends being around only when things are going great. People not being steady in the church because something offended them. In this day and age, I think faithfulness is lacking. But as a church, let us strive towards being a faithful church, faithful to God, Faithful to where he has placed us and faithful to those he has placed in our lives. 
Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Thank you that you are a faithful God, unchanging. You are the same, Lord, today, yesterday, and forever. We thank you that you are a God that in spite of everything that we have failed in, that you are a God who is faithful to us. Thank you that, Lord, you are the God who lifts us up even when we fall down. Lord, we want to be more like you. We want to be more like you, Jesus. I pray that as we strive towards this, Lord, you will help us. Help us to grow the fruits of the Spirit. Help us to grow the fruit of faithfulness. Help us to be faithful, Lord, in the place that you have given us in this world. And as we live lives that are, Lord, pleasing to you, and as people around us see our faithfulness and see, Lord, the character that you have given us, that your name will be glorified and people will be drawn. Like Daniel, Father, that we will also be faithful no matter what the circumstance around us. So people will know that our God is the only way, truth and life. That in you there is, there is life, there is salvation and there is hope. We thank you Lord and praise you that you are working in our lives even when we don't see it. We thank you and praise you that every day we can expect breakthroughs when we walk in your way. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. Thankful for your, we are thankful for your faithfulness that never changes. We love you. We thank you and praise you. I pray that this word will work in our hearts and bear great fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to clap our hands and bless the Lord and thank Him for the word. This is what is lacking in the word and we definitely need it. To show the difference, if Christians live like the rest of the world, then how can we say that we have love and that God is love? Even if when we came to Him, we did not have the qualities that He had. As we keep following, as we come to His presence, His house, automatically all these things will definitely take place. That is as important to approach Him and praise and worship Him. So many things get done when you praise and worship God without you having to struggle. One of the easiest ways that God has taught me, I used to pray and pray and pray. I prayed like all night for eight hours. I'll set the timer and I'll stay up and I'll pray. This was even when I was studying in school or college when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit to check to see how many hours I'm able to pray. And then God said, no, enough. Now you've got to sing. And when you sing and praise and worship God, you get transformed in His presence. That's why I tell you, come and be there in the praise and worship. Yield yourself, sing, open your mouth. Lift up your hands and let all that God has given you be utilized to give Him glory and automatically the fruit of the Spirit. That is called the fruit of the Spirit. No tree struggles to bear fruit. All it needs is water. And who is the water? In the church, the Holy Spirit. You allow Him to move in your life, you will definitely bear that fruit. Why don't you all stand up this morning and thank and praise God and make a decision in our heart that we would be faithful like Him in everything. The people in your life need to know that you're a faithful person, a person of integrity. One thing I often hear my father saying and he ensured and he wanted it to be known about him as integrity, being faithful, being truthful, being dependable, a man of his word. Each and every one of you got to be such a person that you grow up, that everyone will trust. If you say something, they'll say, this person has said it, they will do it. As human beings, we do not have everything under control, but there are certain things that we cannot fail. No matter what, God gave His word that He'll save humanity and He put on flesh and He came and He went even to the point of death on the cross so that He can save us. 
Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and pray that you'll bless her and pray that you'll use her much more mightily in the days to come and pray that, oh Lord, you'll be glorified. And also pray for every sister in Christ here that they'll all utilize the talents that you've given that they will shine bright for you. Find out from you what you want them to do. Wait in your presence and then take this step for we know that you've got great plans in store, oh Lord. Pray for every member of the church. Pray that you be with each and every one throughout this week. Even as we head to the Passion Week. Where we remember your cruise. And pray that everyone would draw closer. That everyone, O oh Lord, would spend time. Understanding the price you pay. And the hope that you gave us. Pray they'll meet every need. Pray they'll cover with your blood and your name and that you will be done in the life of each and every one here. If that's what you want, God's will to happen in your life, I want to lift up your hands and say, yes, Lord, I'm yielding myself. Once again, I'm dedicating myself and telling God, I want your will alone to be done in my life. Not mine, not what the world wants, not what someone else wants. I want you and your will to take place in my life, O oh Lord Jesus. I surrender myself completely. Or even as they, oh Lord, surrender themselves, pray that you will reveal to them and lead them and guide them into all truth. Bless each and every one here in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Why don't you all clap your hands and give God the glory, honor, power, and praise. God bless you. See you all outside. The children can leave for the Sunday school at this time.